All of my important uh, life changes have coincided with facial hair changes, so uh, there's, you, can, you can tell when that was taken. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's really great to be here. Um, uh, so I want to talk a little bit about, uh, about my story and the lessons that I've, that I've learned. Um, I'm a, uh, there we go, uh, I'm a three-time uh, startup founder. Uh, and uh, now I'm a, a VC, a venture capitalist. So I have uh, about 18, 19 years of experience running startups and then for a little over a year now uh, investing in startups. And it's, uh, it's been a really uh, interesting journey. I feel very, uh, very happy and, and very lucky uh, to, be, to be where I am. Um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll start um, at the beginning. I'm a, I'm a computer nerd. Uh, I grew up... Uh, uh, with a personal computer, I always spent much more time programming than playing outside or having friends or anything like that. Uh, and I uh, studied programming uh, and really started um, our first company with a, with a few f college friends of mine. Uh, we were all working together in a, in a bigger company called uh, uh, ATG, which was an early internet company. And we decided um, to, just as an experiment, start our own company. We thought, what would happen uh, if we started our own our own business, we didn't really have any ideas about uh, about what we wanted to do. Uh, it was really just a social experiment. Like, could we actually start a company and only hire people we liked, and not hire anyone who we didn't like? Um, and uh, this was in 1997. And luckily, in 1997, this was right in the middle of the very first uh, internet bubble, the first dot com bubble. And so it was very easy. You could just uh, show up and bring your computer and if you knew how to program people would just give you money uh, so we started a company called engine 5 and uh, we basically built um, e-commerce sites some of the very first online stores for companies like nokia and e-toys and others um, and uh, grew the company to about 15 people uh, and uh, it got very 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 exhausting what we learned is that running your own business is really tiring and kind of worked seven days a week 16 hours a day, um, and we had an opportunity to sell a company uh, in 2000, and we, we were happy to take it and to, to sell a company. And we wound up selling in January of 2000, which was about 20 minutes before the market crashed. Uh, so it was very lucky, very good timing uh, that we sold. Literally, I think, had we waited one more day, it would have been, we would have sold for like 50% of, of, of what we got. Um, but as we sat around, um, and we, we, a couple of years later, we decided let's start another company uh, with the same team, same group of friends from college. And we thought, okay, what lesson did we learn from our, from our first experience? Um, and I think the main lesson we learned is we don't want to do consulting again. Um, our first company was mostly consulting. We worked for other big companies. We built custom systems. And that sucked um, because what we learned is it's very hard work. And you can get paid pretty well, but you only, you're not building any value other than the hours that you put in. So when you're working, when you're you know, typing, they pay you, but as soon as you stop typing, they stop paying you. And uh, we didn't like that. We said, okay, the second company, we're, we're gonna work with our friends, so that was a big success, but we're gonna build a product. Instead of just doing a consulting, we're gonna build a product. Uh, so we started a second company called uh, Core Street, which was a um, security company. And our product was a security product for uh, governments and for big banks. And we built that and, uh, over about six or seven years, and we were lucky to be able to sell that uh, as well. Um, and then we sat around again with the same group of people, and we said, okay, now we just sold two companies, so let's do it again, because you know, let's try it one more time. And what lesson did we learn from Core Street? And the lesson we learned from that is, yeah, it's better to have a product, but the product wasn't for us. Uh, at Core Street, we were making things for banks and for governments, and so we weren't a bank or government. So we had to constantly ask, you know, what, what does the customer want? What does this bank want? What does this big government agency want? And after about seven years, I just didn't care anymore. I, don't, I stopped caring, like, what the Department of Defense wants. Um, I didn't care about uh, what a big bank wanted as a customer. We thought, okay, next time, next company we make, let's make a product that's just for us, that's only for ourselves. So let's make a product that uh, we're the target customer, we don't care about anybody else, uh, we just make something for ourselves, 
and uh, that's it. And the, the bet that we were taking is, um, we thought this was in uh, 2007, is we thought social media is just starting to get big enough where everyone now has perfect information, and so we thought if we made something for ourselves, if we love it, then maybe there's another billion people that would also love it. And because of the new social media, they would all know about it and they would be able to get it and, and to use it. Um, and so that was, uh, that was really the, the genesis of the idea behind Evernote. We, we wanted to make a product. We wanted to make a product for us. And uh, we sat around uh, with the early team and we just had ideas. We said, okay, what, what, what should we make? What are the ideas? Uh, what do we love? And the first idea is we said, well, um, we really like video games. A lot of us uh, big video game players. So we said, we love video games. Why don't we make a video game company? And then I thought, well, you know, I already have like 20 video games sitting on my desk that I haven't had time to play yet. There's already a lot of really great games. There's not enough time to play them. Maybe the world doesn't need, you know, another video game company because there's already so many. So let's do something else. So we said, okay, what else do we like? We thought, well, we really like uh, some of these new social media, some of these social networking apps. Maybe we should make a social networking app. And I remember thought, well, but there's already MySpace and no one can ever beat MySpace. Like MySpace is obviously gonna be the biggest player. You can't compete with them and we didn't wanna do it. So we said, let's not do a social media app. Um, and then we thought about, well, what about, what about productivity? We all loved productivity software, but we thought that there wasn't really um, any new ideas in productivity for 20 years. Microsoft Office hadn't changed for about 20 years before then. And we thought, okay, that's, that seems good. Let's make something that, that makes us smarter. Um, and that was, the, that was the idea behind Evernote. So we started working on this. We met other people that were working on a similar idea. We merged the two companies in 2007. And um, the, the whole point of it was to make a product that we loved. Um, and um, I think this was a very good, uh, this was a very good idea uh, for that time. Uh, and I still think it's a good idea to do. I think one of my biggest um, points of advice to new entrepreneurs that, that pitch me as an investor is I really don't like investing in companies that are obviously not made because of a passion of the entrepreneur. Companies that are made because somebody thinks that it's a good market. I much prefer a company that's made to solve a problem that the entrepreneur has. And there's a very specific reason for this. Um, basically, I think the world has changed in a very specific way in the past 10 years. The world of technology is much more of a meritocracy than it's ever been. Right? A meritocracy means that the, the good products and the good people are you know, more successful. Um, it used to be the case that the quality of your product was a little bit important, but even more important was your marketing, your logistics, your partnership, your go-to-market strategy. I would always hear this advice. Um, you know, board members would tell me, remember, Phil, the best product doesn't always win. I would say, you can have the best product, but you could still lose because somebody could beat you on any of these other things and they can succeed. And I think that's not true anymore in technology. Because if you have the best product, because of social media, everyone's gonna know about it. And you don't have to worry about distribution and marketing. And if you have a great experience and a great product that people love, and um, as long as you're a little bit smart in how you do marketing, the whole world is gonna find out about it. And anyone is gonna be able to download it and to use it. But if you have a bad product, you can spend millions of dollars on marketing and it's, it's not gonna be very effective. So the quality of the product matters in technology much more now than it did 10 years ago in terms of a success of a startup. So all you have to do to be successful is make a great product, which is pretty hard. So how do you increase your chances of making a great product? Well, we thought that we're much more likely to make a great product if we make it for us. So if we are the target users, we don't have to do market research, we don't have to do customer interviews, we didn't do any of that at Evernote in the beginning. No market research, no customer interviews. We just made the product for us. It made us go faster because we could be honest judges about whether or not it was actually getting good. If we were making it for ourselves, we could iterate much faster. We can decide what we wanted to put in, we didn't have to research it, we could put it in, and then we can decide very quickly, is it the right thing? or not, and we could change faster, we can iterate faster, we had faster cycles. And so by making the product for us, we were able to make it better faster. 
Um, and I think that's a very important element of, of what we did right at Evernote, and I still recommend it to almost all startups right now, especially if it's your first startup for first-time entrepreneurs. I say, make the product for yourself, because if you do that, you can make it better much faster than if you have to do the market research to try to figure out what somebody else would like. Now, of course, not everyone can make a product for themselves, right? The world is full of products that aren't made for the people who make them. Um, you know, if people only made products for themselves, then like no one would make dog food, right? Because dogs don't make dog food, people do. You know, no one would make diapers for children because babies don't make diapers. So there's all sorts of products that, you, that, other, that people have to make that isn't for them, but you don't have to. Like when I look at a new entrepreneur, and a new entrepreneur, I say, y somebody else can do this. Somebody else can make an insurance company. You can make something for yourself, especially if it's your first time. Uh, because you're much more likely to iterate faster. And that was really what we did at Evernote, and that worked great for, I don't know, maybe the first five years, maybe the first four or five years, that was very good. And then, then we ran into many problems because of, of this start, because we didn't transition, I think, soon enough. So it worked great in the beginning because we were literally making it for ourselves, and so we could develop very quickly, and we knew what was good, and we were right. If we, could, if we love it, then there's another billion people that loves it too. Um, the problem came that we kept making it for ourselves. And since we kept doing that, we were making products that Evernote employees loved. But Evernote employees were all expert users of Evernote. And so the product became very complicated for new users because we didn't have the empathy for new users. We only had the empathy for us. So we would literally make the product for me, but I'm not a new user, I'm an expert. And so it became very difficult to get new people to have a, a, a simple experience. And so the biggest flaw in Evernote in the first few years was that it was too complicated for new users. And it, it came from this philosophy that we were making things for ourselves. And it was actually quite difficult for us to change that thinking and to hire people that were not Evernote experts and to really start doing user testing and market research to try to make it for people that, that didn't know what we were doing. But for the first you know, five years of the company, it was, it was great. Um, so that was basically our model. Our business model at Evernote was very simple. It was um, make a product, make a great product, know that it's great because we really use it ourselves and we believe it's great, and then um, uh, charge money for it. Uh, we rejected all indirect revenue, so we said we're never going to do uh, advertising. We don't want to do advertising inside of Evernote. Why? Because we're making the product for us and we don't want advertising. Like, the product that I use, I don't want it to have advertising in it. And so, since I'm making it for myself, I'm not going to put something else that I don't want. So we rejected advertising, we rejected data mining, we don't do, like, analysis of your data to sell it to something. Again, because I, I wouldn't want that. Um, all we do is make a product, and if you like it, you pay for it. Um, and that core idea, which is actually very simple, um, actually worked really well for us. Uh, the, um, uh, so we, we, have a f we had a freemium model where you can use Evernote for free and then if you used it enough it got really valuable then you could pay for a more professional version uh, and we have lots of published data about how that, how that worked but it was, a, it was a good experience specifically because we really focused on making something that the longer you use it uh, the more you like it. The longer you use Evernote the more valuable it seems and you're much more likely to pay for something and keep paying for something that you found valuable. Um, so that was, that was basically the model. Uh, the three lessons that I learned from the three companies that I started, you know, the first lesson was just work with your friends, with people that you really like. The second lesson was build a product instead of just being consultants because you build a lot more value. And the third lesson was build something for yourself, not for somebody else because you can make it much faster and you can make it uh, much better. Um, and that was my experience. Um, now I'm, I, I stepped down as Evernote CEO about a year and a half ago, uh, basically because uh, um, I think I was a good CEO at 20 people, 50 people, 100 people. It started to get s difficult for me at about 250 people. Uh, basically when there were so many employees that didn't know everyone, when I didn't know everyone's name and I didn't know everyone's face is when it started to get uh, pretty hard. 
uh, I just didn't have the skills for that. I have, I think my skills are more about solving the early problems in a company. Uh, and it's a very different skill set to solve the, the later problems. And when, by the time uh, I left, we were at about 400 people or a little bit more. And I really felt that the company deserved a CEO that was really good at, at that scale. Uh, so it, we were very happy to be able to find a great CEO. I became the, the chairman for a while, and then I stepped off the board a few months ago to really focus on, on being an investor, on being a, a VC. Um, and I love it because it lets me work at exactly the area that I want to, which is solving the, the early puzzles, the early stage problems of companies. So I work with many startups, and uh, I get to help, advise, create, make new ideas, help existing ideas, but, but at the stage where I'm, I'm best at, which is in the, you know, the, the beginning stages um, of the company. And um, I think that right now, uh, in 2016, is actually the best time um, ever to start a new company and to invest. And um, I don't know if any of you heard my keynote uh, just now in, in the big auditorium. I talked a little bit, a bit about this in the, in the keynote, uh, and I just want to elaborate a little bit on that. I literally think that, that right now, this, like in this year, is the best time to start something new in technology and to invest in something. And it's, it's because of this. Um, I think in the history of technology waves, you have uh, very slow periods and then very fast periods. There's periods when things seem kind of slow and the stock markets aren't doing that well and investment is down. And then there's periods where it's growing really, really quickly. And if you look back throughout most of history of technology, most of the really fundamentally important companies are started during the slow periods. They're not started when everything is good, they're started when things are bad. Um, you know, I'm from, I am live in California now, there's a lot of people that make wine and there's a, a saying in California that, uh, uh, you know, the hardest earth makes the best, uh, the best wine, the best grapes. Uh, companies that you plant in hard earth during difficult times, they're actually much more likely to succeed for, for many reasons because they, they, they have good habits at the beginning, they don't waste too much money, but also because the slow periods are when fundamental new technologies are, are created. And then those technologies is what powers the, the fast growth for the next decade or so. Um, let me give you a couple of examples. So I started working in the early 90s uh, in technology. And uh, I remember in 1994, 95 was a, um, a uh, very slow period. It was a stock market crash, slow investment, and that's right when I started working professionally. And in 94, 95, you had the creation of uh, Amazon and Yahoo, right? two of the most important companies in technology since then. And it was because the technology that, that changed, that became available during that time period was the internet. This was internet 1.0, desktop browsers, desktop computers, web browsers, internet, Amazon, and Yahoo. And then that led to about seven years of very fast growth, uh, and all the way up to the first dot-com bubble, uh, where I was lucky enough to start my first company and then sell it 20 minutes before it crashed. And then it all crashed in 2000, and some of you remember. And 2000, 2001 was very slow for new companies. But during that time period, 1999, 2000, that's when Google started, and Google became really big. Because the new technology that was invented then, during that slow period, was uh, search and payments. And both of these were available before, but they were never good enough. Like, Google made search really excellent, and they made internet advertising really excellent, and they made payments really good. And that powered the next 10 years. And so people think that it's a slow period and then it's fast, but really it's only fast because of the fundamental technologies that are started during the slow periods. And then it was fast again until 2007, 2008. And if you remember in 2008, it was a terrible year, right? This was the financial crisis, very few startups, big crash, no investment. But wh what was started in 2007, 2008? Well, Evernote, Dropbox, Uber, Airbnb, Stripe, pretty much all of the unicorns right now started during that time period. Uh, and what was the thing that enabled, what was the technology that enabled that growth? Well, it was, um, it was mobile and social. It was, it was the iPhone and it was Facebook and it was Twitter. And that led to the next eight to nine years of very fast growth. And now things are slow again. And now we're again at that flat period in 2016. 
and the most important companies for the next decade are being started right now. There, there are companies that got started six months ago to 12 months from now. This is the slow period. And the companies that we create right now are going to be the next unicorns that power the next decade um, of growth. And why does this happen? Like, why this pattern? It's so predictable, it's so repeatable that there must be a reason. Um, and I think there is a reason. It's basically this. When things are growing fast, during the, the period when things are growing really quickly, people get lazy. And by people, I mean entrepreneurs and investors. They get lazy. They, they create me too companies and they invest in me too companies. They see what's growing really fast and they just make more companies that are the same. They just make clones. So once you have Amazon, you have 10 other e-commerce companies. Once you have Facebook, you have Facebook for dogs and 10 other social media companies. When things are growing really fast, the most of the companies are copycats. They're me too's, they're just slight changes, but they're the same ideas that are already working. And most VCs, like me, it's kind of our fault as well. We invest in copycat companies because we invest in things that were working two years ago, so why not keep working on them? So during the, p the period of fast growth, you actually, for the most part, don't get a lot of real innovation. But when things go bad, when things go slow, when the Me Too companies go out of business, you, you can't start Me Too companies because they're not gonna be successful, and so it actually forces both entrepreneurs and investors to think original thoughts. It's during the slow periods where we have to actually come back to basics and, thinks, and think, okay, what are the big changes over the next decade? So that's why I think it's the slow periods that cause most of the fundamental innovation. And um, um, what is gonna be the innovation during this slow period? I really believe it's gonna be AI, or artificial intelligence. I really think that just like the internet drove the cycle from 1994, and then um, search drove the cycle from 2000, and then mobile drove the cycle from 2008, the cycle that starts in 2016 is AI. Uh, and that's why most of my investments right now are in uh, AI-related companies, because I think AI is the next platform uh, that's gonna power this, the, the, the next decade of growth. I think there's gonna be, uh, the last time that I had this feeling where I felt like we were in a slow period, but I think I know what's gonna cause the growth was in 2007 when we started Evernote. And I have the same feeling now. And in 2007, I can make one bet, and I'm very, very lucky that the bet I made, which was Evernote, worked out. Uh, now I feel like I get to make 20 bets as a, as a VC, and uh, that's a great feeling, the fact that I can, I can do this now, I can take 20 bets, 50 bets, in companies that I think are gonna be the most important companies. Uh, I feel like this is the greatest job in the world. So I feel very lucky uh, to be here, both you know, here in Brazil right now, but also just here in life, and uh, I know there's a lot of reason for uh, pessimism in the world right now, but I think it's easy to be pessimistic in the short term, but it's also very easy to be optimistic in the long term because I really do believe that uh, this year is the best year to, uh, to start something, so that's what I'm here. So that's, uh, that's my story. I'm happy to, uh, to take any questions and take the discussion uh, wherever you want it to go. Thank you. Hi, Phil. Uh, I company that is not a technology company, but a company that uses technology. And right now, we'd like to know what are the tips for this kind of company? Because um, it's like everybody in the mobile wave, like you said. It's uh, okay. Like in the mobile wave that you mentioned, every company invested a lot to come up with an app for the users to use. And guess what? They download use it once and then they don't want it anymore, they want to drop it. And all of these companies just get stuck with these apps that no one wants to have in their mobile phones anymore. So what would be a tip to use this kind of technology in a smart way? Um, well, thank you for your question. Um, this is a, a, a common question uh, that we get. Uh, a lot of people say that um, there's a big problem with apps because there's um, you know five million apps in the app store, and if you have five million apps, you know how is the average app going to get discovered and, and used? Obrigado pela pergunta, uma boa pergunta e uma pergunta muito comum, porque todas as empresas têm os apps e agora tem tipo 
milhões de apps nas lojas. Então, a questão é como que aquele seu aplicativo, aquele seu app vai se diferenciar dos outros. E isso vai ficar ainda pior com... This is going to get even worse with, with what I'm investing in now, which is uh, bots and AI, because if there's 5 million apps, there's going to be 100 million bots very soon. So if you have 100 million bots, how is the average one you know, ever going to uh, get used or get discovered? This is a, a, a big question. Hello. E olha, isso só vai piorar daqui para frente, porque se tem 5 milhões de apps agora, eu agora estou, por exemplo, investindo muito nesses robozinhos, né, em inteligência artificial. Então, se são 5 milhões de APPs, vão ser tipo 100 milhões desses robots por aí. Então, a questão é como é que, vai, qual vai ser a, como é que você vai conseguir encontrar aquele robozinho médio que vai te servir no meio de tanta coisa? Mas eu acho que a resposta é que vai ser da mesma maneira que as pessoas são descobertas. Há 7 bilhões de pessoas. Como as pessoas se tornam famosas? Como as pessoas se tornam conhecidas? Um, well, they, they, they either have to be lucky or they have to be good. And everyone talks about the people who are really exceptional and they have opportunities. And I really think that apps and bots are going to be used and discovered the same way that people are. Uh, and so it's not going to matter if there's 5 million or 100 million or a billion because the best ones, the most important ones, are going to get famous and get discovered. So if you're making an app right now or you're making a bot, I say you have to think about it in the same way as you're uh, promoting a, a, a musician or uh, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to uh, promote someone who is a famous author or uh, economist. It has to be about being famous because you're really good at something. Uh, and it, the same thing will apply to, to technology. Então, para responder a sua pergunta, eu acho que o aplicativo vai ser descoberto da mesma forma que as pessoas são descobertas. Não é? Para você ser descoberto, para você ter sucesso no mundo com tantas pessoas, você tem que ou ter muita sorte, ou você tem que ser muito bom. As pessoas têm que falar muito bem de você. Então, eu acho que os aplicativos e esses robots, eles vão ser descobertos da mesma maneira. Independente de serem hoje 5 milhões, ou 100 milhões amanhã, ou 1 bilhão daqui para frente, os melhores vão ser descobertos e vão ser usados. Então, eu diria, uma dica seria você promover o seu app da mesma forma que hoje em dia você promove um músico, que você promove um, um autor, que você promove um economista, não é? Vai ficar famoso aquele que for realmente bom. Excelente. Mais perguntas? Aqui. Oi, boa tarde, Fio. Eu também sou de Fortaleza, a gente trabalha na empresa de consultoria, a Gomes de Matos Consultoria, e a gente trabalha com gestão de pessoas. E a gente queria saber quais eram as práticas de gestão de pessoas que você usava lá na Evernote. I'm also from the Northeast. The first question also came from a lady from the Northeast. And I work for a consulting company and we do people management. So I would like to know what were your people management practices at Evernote? Um, well, I think that I personally um, have a very limited experience with people management at a big scale. In fact, I think this was my uh, number one shortcoming as a CEO, is uh, after we got to a few hundred people, um, it, like, it wasn't something that I was good at managing. I think I'm very good at managing a small team of nerds that are on a mission, that we all want to do this very important thing, and uh, we can walk through walls to do that mission. But when there's a few hundred people and, and most of them think about uh, a job and they think about their career and they think about how do they get promoted, um, that's beyond my skill set. Um, and uh, I think the only good thing that I would say about me there is I, I recognize that it's beyond my skill set and uh, in time to hire people that were actually very good at that. Uh, so I very much respect what you do and it's not something that I'm personally good at. Ok. Bem, o que eu posso te dizer é que eu, pessoalmente, admiro muito o seu trabalho, porque é uma coisa que eu não faço muito bem, gerir, gerenciar pessoas. É, eu, na realidade, é uma das minhas limitações. Eu, eu fui muito bom, eu sou muito bom para gerenciar pessoas num grupo pequeno, quando são pessoas muito focadas, 
um, um grupo que tem um objetivo comum e que vai atravessar todas as barreiras para atingir esse objetivo. Na nossa empresa, na Evernote, quando passou de 100 pessoas, eu já comecei a ter problema. Já foi difícil para mim, porque eu tinha que lidar com pessoas que estavam pensando naquele, naquele trabalho delas como um emprego, a carreira, a promoção, e eu já não faço isso muito bem. Então, eu, a única vantagem que eu tive é que eu tive a, a, a sabedoria de contratar alguém que fosse bom para fazer isso, que eu não conseguia fazer bem. Você quer que eu pergunte um pouco mais sobre as práticas da empresa? Right, an add-on question. So, what were the practices that the company had to manage people? Well, I think the, the most important um, practice early on uh, that I really believed in was um, I wanted everyone in the company to understand why they were doing something. Uh, I really tried to have Evernote be a 100-year startup. So I wanted it to survive for 100 years, but I also wanted it to always be a startup, always innovating. And I thought that the difference between a startup and a big company is in a startup, every single person knows why they're doing something. But in a big company, there's many people who don't understand why they're doing something. They just do it because somebody tells them. But they don't, they don't understand why. They think it's stupid. So the most important thing that I try to do is to say every employee should understand why they're doing their job. And they don't have to agree with it, but they at least have to understand it. And I think the day that you have one person who doesn't understand why they're doing something, that's when you stop being a startup and start to be a, a big company. Vamos lá. Eu acho que a prática mais importante, eu acho, é que todos os funcionários devem entender o porquê eles fazem o que eles fazem no trabalho deles. É, eu, quando crio uma startup, eu penso que eu quero criar aquela startup para durar 100 anos. Mas, ainda assim, eu quero que ela permaneça uma startup. Eu quero que ela permaneça com DNA de inovação. Então, eu acho que é muito importante que todos os funcionários saibam exatamente a razão deles fazerem o que eles têm que fazer. É, eu acho que a partir do... É um risco. Essa é a grande diferença, aliás, de uma startup para uma empresa grande. Uma empresa grande, você tem um monte de gente lá que faz o que tem que fazer sem saber o porquê, só faz porque mandaram fazer. Então, eu acho que é isso. A, a prática mais importante para mim em gerir pessoas é que todo funcionário entenda o porquê que ele faz aquilo. Ele pode não concordar com aquilo, mas ele sabe o porquê que ele tem que fazer aquilo. A partir do momento que você tem uma pessoa que faz, faz o que faz, trabalha sem entender o porquê, você está deixando de ser uma startup, você está virando uma empresa grande. And I think the, the, main the main technique that we used to make sure that everyone understood why they were doing something was um, it was very important that everyone understands what we're trying to optimize for. Um, many disagreements in companies happen when people don't agree on what they're trying to optimize for. Some people may think that the most important thing is to get more new customers, and somebody else may think that the most important thing is to get uh, more money from existing customers. And if you don't agree on what the most important thing is, then it's very hard to have everyone understand why they're doing something. So what we really tried to do is every week, we had a 20-minute all-hands meeting where everyone stood up, and we talked about what is the one most important thing that we're trying to optimize for, And then we said, this is what we're trying to do, and that's why we're doing these five steps. And then anyone working on the five steps, even if they didn't agree with it, they could at least know that they were doing it because we said, this is what we're trying to optimize for. So I think that was uh, the most successful and most important part of how we uh, manage people. Nós utilizamos uma técnica na, na Evernote. Era bastante comum, porque para nós o mais importante era que as pessoas entendessem o que é que nós estávamos tentando otimizar. As pessoas têm diferentes ideias em relação ao que, ao que elas estão tentando fazer. Algumas pessoas podem, podiam achar, nós queremos ter mais clientes. Outras podem pensar, nós queremos ter mais dinheiro, mais receita vindo dos clientes existentes. Então, é muito importante que todo o time esteja focado no mesmo propósito. O que é que é a coisa mais importante que nós estamos tentando otimizar? Então, uma técnica que nós fazíamos, uma prática, era toda semana, a gente reunia todo mundo, já todo mundo em pé durante 20 minutos, e falava assim, qual é a coisa mais importante que a gente está tentando fazer aqui na empresa? Então, as pessoas tinham que saber o que era aquilo e quais, e quais eram os cinco passos para atingir aquilo. 
Então, alguns podiam até não concordar, mas eles sabiam o que, que era e quais eram os cinco passos para chegar naquilo. Então, essa é uma prática que funcionou muito bem para nós lá. Mais perguntas? Já tem uma pessoa ali, duas, três. Vamos lá, por favor. É, a respeito da entrada de capital quando a Evernote era o startup, como você soube de esse é o momento do capital X em troca de Y ações da minha empresa? Então, a empresa loja vai crescendo e vai adquirindo o valor de mercado. Como você soube balancear a entrada de investimento com a porcentagem que você cedia em troca? Com a, a, em troca das ações da empresa, né? The question has to do with the capital inflow to your startups, because you you had your goal and you had a company, and then capital started flowing in, and you had that that became stocks and shares. And so, how did you balance all that? The fact that the funding was flowing in, and you had the stocks to deal with. Um, well, I think. Um, uh, There's one, I think, big difference between uh, Silicon Valley uh, companies and uh, really companies, startups anywhere else in the world, and it, it mostly has to do with the investors. Uh, I think the entrepreneurs are actually very similar everywhere, but I think the investors are pretty different. And um, Silicon Valley VCs have a very specific thing that they want, and it's pretty different than investors anywhere else in the world. Bom, eu acho que existe uma certa diferença entre as startups do Vale do Silício e as outras startups no resto do planeta. Ah, na realidade, os, em, os empreendedores são iguais em qualquer lugar. É a mesma coisa. O que, o que difere são os investidores. E eu acho que os capitalistas de risco que investem em startups do Vale do Silício agem de uma forma muito diferente. Ele vai continuar. I think um, investors in uh, in Brazil and investors in most places of the world uh, push their companies to get to profitability. They really want to optimize for for profitability, for cash flow, for building a, a real business. Um, and this is to minimize the number of their companies that fail. VCs in Silicon Valley don't really care if companies fail. They want to invest in companies that have a small chance to succeed, but if they succeed, it's massive. So they only want to invest in companies, we only want to invest in companies that have a chance to be worth $10 billion or $100 billion. If a company can only be worth $100 million or $500 million, it's not interesting to us. And this is a big difference. So the, the pressure from the capital in Silicon Valley is to grow faster and to, to scale and to really reach a worldwide scale where you have a chance to be worth many billions of dollars. And I think that, that explains a lot of the, the, the difference and it also explains a lot of what we did at Evernote and a lot of what other Silicon Valley unicorns do, uh, it's really uh, in response to what the investors want. E é um pouco diferente, então, como eu dizia, os, os investidores e empresas do Vale do Silício, normalmente, as, vamos voltar, normalmente os investidores vão investir num novo negócio querendo o quê? Eles vão forçar. Aumentar a lucratividade, fluxo de caixa, crescer o negócio. Os investidores do Vale do Silício, eles não se importam com nada disso. Na verdade, eles querem investir na, em pequenos negócios que têm uma chance mínima de ter sucesso. Ok, mas se tiver sucesso, vai ser uma empresa de 10 bilhões, de 100 bilhões. Para nós, que investimos em empresas, startups do Vale do Silício, uma empresa com potencial de crescer para 100 milhões, 500 milhões, não interessa isso. A gente quer aquela empresa que vai crescer muito. Então, a mentalidade do investidor é que muda. Você perguntou como lidar com essa coisa das ações, a pressão do investidor. Não tem, porque o que, que, que ele quer? É um típico investidor que investe no Vale do Silício. Então, ele quer que aquela empresa cresça rápido e se espalhe pelo mundo inteiro e chegue ao, ao bilhão. Então, essa é, que é a diferença. Então, é mais fácil lidar. Pegando um pouquinho o gancho nessa pergunta, depois eu passo para outras, é, eu queria pedir para ele fazer uma avaliação do universo de startups no Brasil. Como ele avalia, como é que nós estamos, uma análise dele. Could you give us an idea of what you think about the universe of startups in Brazil? Um, so I, I think, um, uh, I really believe that um, entrepreneurial talent is distributed the world over. And wherever you have a, 
uh, a good uh, university system and a lot of young people in gathered in concentrations, you can have very strong startup culture. And so the entrepreneurial and the startup culture in Brazil is very strong from, from what I've seen. Um, I think, again, the difference is really a difference in investors. I think the entrepreneurs are the same. The entrepreneurs in Sao Paulo are just as good as the entrepreneurs in San Francisco, but the investors are different. Uh, and I'm not saying that the investors in Brazil are worse than the investors in Silicon Valley. They're just different. They put different pressures uh, on the entrepreneurs, and I think that, that's the main reason why you have uh, such differences in outcomes. Eu acredito que o talento empreendedor existe no mundo todo. Se você tiver um bom conjunto de universidades, um, um bom conjunto de jovens, as startups vão fluir, elas vão aparecer, é uma consequência natural disso. E vão ser startups fortes. Então, eu acho que aqui no Brasil existe esse potencial enorme, como existe em qualquer lugar do mundo. A diferença são os investidores. De novo, empreendedor é igual no mundo inteiro. O que difere é o investidor. Eu acho que o investidor, os empreendedores aqui de São Paulo são tão bons quanto os empreendedores de São Francisco. A diferença são os investidores que investem nesses empreendedores aqui. O tipo de pressão que é colocada nesses empreendedores é outra. Os desfechos são distintos por causa disso. E eu acho que há uma área importante em que os empreendedores em São Paulo têm uma grande vantagem over entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, which is, I think, the, the next giant idea, the next giant company, the next Facebook, is much more likely to come out to be something that's meant for dense urban environments. You know, life in a big city is very different from life in, uh, in, in, in a small place. So it's very unlikely that the next major multi-billion dollar idea is going to come from Palo Alto, because Palo Alto is like a little village. Even New York City, compared to like Sao Paulo, is a pretty small town. So I think the advantage right now, if there was the right investor, is for ideas to come out of very dense urban environments like Sao Paulo, like Beijing, you know, like Seoul. Those are going to be where the next um, Facebook-like companies come from. So I think there's a, a very good advantage to the local ecosystem. It just needs investors to put the right pressure. Eu acrescentaria que eu acredito que o próximo grande gigante, o próximo grande, aspas, Facebook da vida, virá de um ambiente urbano denso como São Paulo. Eu acho que São Paulo tem uma grande vantagem no momento, porque eu acredito que a próxima próximo gigante de multibilhões de dólares não vai vir de Palo Alto. Palo Alto é um vilarejo comparado com São Paulo. Até Nova York é, um, é uma cidade pequena comparada com, Nova, com São Paulo. Então, eu acredito que se nós estivéssemos aqui, o investidor com o perfil certo, a grande novidade que virá que viria por aí, sairia de um ambiente urbano denso como São Paulo, como Seul, como Pequim, viria de algum lugar assim. Então, mais uma pergunta para a gente encerrar. Eu passo aqui para a plateia. Sr. Levin, thank you for your sharing, sharing with us your background and your experience and insights. I will do a pragmatic question. I really want to know, me and my friends, uh, how to get information about the trend, the investment trend on uh, AI, artificial intelligence. Where can we find information? Pergunta é onde podemos encontrar informações sobre as tendências em inteligência artificial. Um, so I, I, I have the same question. Uh, I am very interested in finding out the trends in uh, AI investment because that's what I'm investing in. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, uh, my strategy is uh, uh, twofold. Um, I look at a lot of the interesting work being done in universities. So uh, my team has identified the most interesting professors at Stanford, at Berkeley, at MIT, uh, at Carnegie Mellon, uh, at a few universities in China that are doing the most interesting AI work. And we, we go and we talk to them. And we ask, who are your most entrepreneurial students? Who's going to start the next company? Um, and I would actually love to find out what are the universities in Brazil and what are the specific professors and departments that are doing the most interesting AI work uh, and go and talk to those people. And so that's a big part of my job. 
And then the second part is honestly, I look to see uh, what are all of the other top tier VCs investing in. So we see, I consider there are about 20 VC firms that are really good. You know, we're lucky enough to be one of them, but there's another 19 or so that are also very good. And uh, we track all of the investments and try to see what, what's moving. Eu tenho essa mesma pergunta, mesma dúvida, saber quais são as tendências em inteligência artificial. A minha estratégia é dupla, na realidade. A primeira perna dessa estratégia é ir para as universidades, procurar os professores, que estão, os grandes professores que estão trabalhando nessa área. Então, eu vou a universidades como Stanford, MIT, Carnegie Mellon e várias outras, inclusive na China também. Vou conversar com esses professores, perguntar para eles quem são os alunos deles que estão indo muito bem nessa área, que estão empreendendo nessa área. Então, eu, eu, por exemplo, aqui no Brasil, se fosse vocês, eu procuraria nas grandes universidades brasileiras e ia falar com esses professores para saber quem é que está trabalhando na área de inteligência artificial. Minha segunda perna de estratégia é ver o que, que os outros, é, outras pessoas que investem né, o capital de risco, o que, que elas estão fazendo. Né? Tem cerca de umas 20 firmas que são muito boas por aí, então a gente troca ideias, a gente conversa para poder acompanhar as tendências que vão acontecendo. Um, I can tell you what I think the important trends are going to be, uh, but this is just a guess on, on my part. Um, I think there's, um, uh, up to now, for the past five years, I think AI development has really been about the data. So the actual algorithms have uh, stopped advancing about five years ago, and the progress has been just on how much data you can process and feed into the algorithms. So that's why a lot of people right now think that big companies that have a lot of data have a huge advantage in AI. So Google and Facebook you know, have a huge advantage because they have so much data. I actually don't agree with this. I think that the next wave of AI is going to be in the algorithms. So the algorithms that haven't advanced in the past five years, I think are going to start advancing. And the amount of data is going to become less important than how good the algorithms are. So I'm looking for teams that are using new algorithms that don't require as much training data, uh, but can still produce very good results. And I think that's a very investable area for the next few years. Eu posso dizer o que eu acho, mas é mais um chute do que qualquer outra coisa. Nos últimos cinco anos, os algoritmos pararam de se desenvolver, eles meio que se estagnaram. E, e sempre as pessoas pensam em inteligência artificial como se fosse relacionada à capacidade de processamento de dados. Então, há quem pense que a, as empresas que acumulam muitos dados têm uma grande vantagem na área de inteligência artificial. Empresas como Google, Facebook, têm muitos dados, então há quem ache que elas já estão partindo na frente das outras. Eu tendo a discordar disso, porque eu acho que a diferença vai estar nos algoritmos. Não, esses algoritmos que nos últimos cinco anos não avançaram tanto assim, na minha opinião, a partir de agora, eles vão começar a avançar mais. E é, o sucesso virá de algoritmos de boa qualidade. 